Okay, so um, technological revolutions in, in, in faith, uh, especially as it deals with, with work. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just briefly uh, look at some of the, uh, there's been just a whole slew, just an ongoing stream of technologic revolutions throughout uh, history. Uh, some of the current revolutions that we are living in now, uh, and then some emerging revolutions probably going to happen in the next, uh, I'd say, 30 years. Uh, and specifically something that's called the Fourth Industrial Revolution, because this is the one that has uh, the impact on, on work, on jobs, uh, especially. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and conclude by taking a look at just the nature of work as, as a God-given blessing, uh, and how Christians might respond as we, um, uh, as we uh, uh, find uh, technological unemployment uh, impacting our societies. So just some of the uh, historic revolutions, uh, both technologic and, and social revolutions. Obviously, there's the agricultural revolution, uh, and um, there's uh, like metallurgy. Uh, Gunpowder made a huge uh, difference in terms of empire shipping pretty much throughout history. You know, advances in shipping have made a huge difference. Uh, the printing press, I think we can identify that technological revolution as being huge, uh, not only for like the uh, you know, Gutenberg Bible and the, and the Protestant Reformation and all of the religious and social changes that that brought about, but also the scientific revolution, I'm sure, was, was greatly accelerated due to printing. Um, on the, uh, on the uh, religious and uh, social side of things, there was the Protestant Revolution, Certainly, like the Democratic uh, Revolution, which uh, America played a, such a, a key role in. Uh, the Scientific Revolution, uh, huge. Uh, and then the Industrial Revolution. Um, and uh, really beginning to increase the, uh, the Industrial Revolution, increasing the, sort of the quality of life by allowing sort of cheap goods. I'm going to throw in public education as, as a major revolution. I think that's had a major force in shaping uh, societies around the world. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if this is, we think of it as revolution, but getting rid of slavery, I think that, that was also uh, huge and, and stands sort of in this list. Uh, transportation uh, revolution has, uh, I think, dramatically changed our societies. Um, and I'm going to say like entertainment. Uh, sort of becoming a, a monoculture uh, to some extent uh, around the world. Uh, civil rights being one of the social revolutions uh, and uh, maybe even like sexual revolution, you know. It seems as though these revolutions are sort of maybe increasing in frequency. Uh, so those are some of the historic revolutions. Current revolutions, I don't know. I, 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 this is probably nowhere close to a comprehensive list, but I've just identified we're living in the uh, sort of the internet uh, revolution uh, I don't know, is, is smartphones a revolution? It, it strikes me uh, that it is. Um, it's, you know, we're just, so many of us are, are uh, almost feel like that we need that. Social media might be considered to be a, a revolution. And I'm actually going to throw in sort of the distribution. I mean, this is maybe a humble one, but I think this is uh, uh, increasing, uh, ch changing the way that, that we get things. And I think this is sort of a key thing. Um, but I want to look forward a little bit, and it's not the too distant future, and, and that is the emerging revolutions. So I think you guys have been hearing about self-driving cars. I think this is not just a, you know, a nice feature that we might get in our, our next car, but uh, I think that this could um, uh, impact like truck drivers, you know. Um, and uh, there's actually, it looks like there's beginning to merge a space uh, revolution with uh, low-cost reusable launch vehicles, sort of an area of interest of mine, uh, and then drones, um, as well as uh, basically robotics. I think this is, this is uh, going to be a huge one, especially as, a, as it affects jobs. Um, so there's something that's called, uh, <laughs> thank you for trying. 
uh, something called the Fourth Industrial Rev Revolution, and that is a, a set of emerging technologies. And why is it called the Fourth Industrial Revolution? Well, we sort of identify four revolutions. Uh, we're mostly in the third one right now, but like the, the first one is mechanical production based on sort of uh, water and steam power beginning in the late 1800s. Think of uh, like uh, instead of people pounding uh, uh, or having ox, you know, going around and grinding, uh, grinding grains. Instead, we have, you know, water-driven thing, and then steam came along. We had the factories and the Industrial Revolution there. Um, and then they say 2.0 is maybe in the late 1800s, and this is really factories. It's the sort of division of labor and becoming more and more e efficient, to, you know, like textiles, you know, having looms that are producing mass quantities and that, you know, made, uh, uh, you know, like back in Christ's day, you could legitimately speak about not having clothes, couldn't afford clothes. Well, you know, at some point in time, you know, that's, if you're not clothed, that's because you're choosing not to, not because you can't afford it, because uh, textiles became so cheap. Um, and then uh, uh, 3.0 could be said to be uh, sort of in the late um, 60s, early 70s, in, in which you, you really have really greater application of automation. You're beginning to, to replace uh, workers with, with, smart, uh, with smart machines. Uh, and then the fourth industrial revolution is really using cyber physical systems. This would be things like uh, really smart systems, artificial intelligence, uh, and uh, robotics, and the, especially the combination, the, the, the synergy between those things. So um, the fourth industrial technologies are, are generally recognized. So it's sort of the, there, there's more than this, but these are the ones that people really talk about. Uh, 3D printing um, is emerging. Uh, robotics, we, we've had a robotics for a while, but the new generation of robotics is really, I think, fundamentally uh, revolutionary. And then artificial intelligence, which I'll, I'll get into, because that is the that's, the, that's almost a scary one. That's, that's some bizarre things are happening in that, in that realm. Okay, so 3D printing. How many of you here have ever seen a 3D printed object? Okay, maybe about 60% of you, 70%. Um, so just to help you understand 3D printing, printing can, or, or there can be like manufacturing, there's additive and, and subtractive. So subtractive is sort of like sculpting where you have uh, an item, whether it's metal or plastic or rock or whatever, and then you remove material from that. 3D printing is sort of the opposite, and, and that is where you're only using material to make the thing that, you, that you're looking at. So the thing is with 3D printers is that it, it's true, you can go ahead and make some structures that you cannot really produce by other forms of manufacturing. That's not so much the, the key to what's revolutionary about it. Instead, you can, you can go to like a website called Thingiverse and you can download a file that somebody has produced at some place and some time elsewhere. You can download that file and then you can go ahead and print it out. Uh, and you can have this in, in your home. Which means that if you say, oh wow, that's really cool, somebody has made a new lampshade. Well, you could download that file and print it out. Uh, now, I think that right now 3D printing is a, um, is a new technology and it's, I think it's sort of immature. There's a lot of it's being done in plastic and I think that has some utility, but uh, I think really we'd need to have to go to, to metals and some other you know, multiple materials, and then make, make uh, things that mix those things together. Uh, but that's, that's coming, that's just a matter of time. So here are some of the things that you can uh, download and print. You can, you know, tools, you know, if you need a tool, you can run out to a hardware store. Uh, after you use it once, if you don't need it, you sort of put it in the grinder and it produces metal uh, things. You can sort of recycle and print something out. Um, you know, new, new forms of furniture, uh, shoes, clothing, these, these sorts of things. They're sort of primitive, I think, right now, but I think we're, we're sort of seeing the future here. But let's think about those, those shoes. Uh, if you can print your own shoes, then what does that do to the supply chain and all of the jobs uh, involved? Well, you know, the manufacturing, you got all these people maybe in, in China, uh, you know, factory assembly lines, they're, they're not needed. Our friend, the truck driver, you know, he's not really needed because 
Well, we need the material delivered uh, to our house, but that could be done by drone. Um, and then our, our uh, friendly fellow at Walmart who sold the, the shoes, well, he's not really needed anymore either. So that 3D printing sort of has this back effect on a number of jobs that got the finished product uh, to our home. Um, so, you know, this is, this is the sort of thing you can do. Um, uh, now, robotics, um, we, we all know, like, you know, in auto manufacturing, there's a lot, you know, over time, there's been an increasing application of, uh, of producing um, cars with, with robots. This is, this is really going big time. They're getting to the point where, especially with artificial intelligence and, and computer vision, uh, that you can now program these robots to do a lot of things that normally you would, you would have required people to do. Um, think about the fast food restaurants. Uh, and uh, they, they now have robots that can produce burgers um, that are just perfect, you know, every single time. Uh, and um, now you may say, I, I think I'd rather have a, you know, have some food that was produced by people, not by machine. But when it comes right down to it, it's going to be cheaper uh, to have the machines uh, do, do it. Um, and the reason for that is you don't have to pay them wages. You have to pay on sort of an upfront cost for the hardware uh, and probably for the license for the, for the programs. Um, but uh, after that, you don't, you don't have wages. You don't have health care benefits. You don't have PTO. These things can be working 24-7, uh, you know. Um, and uh, here's another one, dr drones. How many of you here have actually yourself physically seen a drone fly? Okay, maybe 70, maybe 80% of you. Um, so drones, um, you know, these, these are, uh, they've actually had a pizza delivery drone, you know. They, they do have all of these sort of interesting one-time, one-off sorts of things, delivering, um, uh, dry cleaning, um, medical supplies. There's, there's this, uh, this is a Kickstarter campaign, and this is pretty cool. You call in, you know, in a few minutes, your, uh, uh, your defibrillator is, is there. And somebody's talking to you to, to give you instructions and be with you. Uh, okay, this is the interesting one, artificial intelligence. Uh, and, I mean, this, this sounds sci-fi, but uh, something's happened in the last, say, five years that's really really changed this, uh, deep learning. Um, so the, the new artificial intelligence isn't what we call expert systems where you have smart people programming a program to do exactly what you want, but in, instead they have taken things that they've learned in neuroscience about how neurons interact with each other, and I think they have discovered something very uh, fundamental as to how brains work. Uh, and they are now applying it. And basically the, the issue is it's, it has to do with neural networks where you have an input layer of neurons. Now these are electronic neurons. These could be like sensors on a camera. Um, and then you have an output layer and that's, that's causing you to send out information or, or to activate some, some movement on, on, a, on a robot. The key thing is that you have what's called the hidden layers and you have a hyper -connect connection between each of the layers, and it's really the strength of those connections and the pattern of the connections that, that go from the raw data to increasing level of, of recognition. Um, and um, it is very sophisticated, uh, and what they are able to get these um, computers to do now is nothing short of remarkable. And I'll show you some of that. Um, this is a machine, I think it's called Deep Blue uh, by uh, IBM, uh, and uh, this is the key moment in which it beat, I think it's Kasparov. Um, so, you know, this is sort of just, a, I think it was 1997. And uh, so this is sort of a key moment showing, you know, the, the uh, increasing capability of computers compared with humans. Uh, most recently, AlphaGo is, a, I think, an Asian game. Uh, and it's, it's apparently much, much harder uh, than chess. Uh, and now not only has a computer beat the best AlphaGo player, uh, but it's at a level de developed now that uh, it's basically, it will always beat them. It's, it's, it's far superior. 
Um, and this is using the, the deep learning. This is rather interesting. Uh, do you remember the old Atari games? Uh, and what they have now done is they, they have these uh, deep learning uh, systems that will take this, they will get, feed it the pixels, they will tell the score and give it the goal of maximizing the score. And it plays and plays and plays uh, randomly at first, but eventually it learns until it is able to um, you know, basically be better than, than a human. Well, they, that might not be so surprising, except that then they give it another one, another game, and the computer that has never been exposed to that game before, and you, you don't tell it how, what, what the game is or how to play it, and it figures out how to play it. So it's a generalized artificial intelligence to where it can handle things that it, it was never exposed to before and it can learn, okay? And generalized artificial intelligence is, is, um, is rather important. Um, here, here's where they're taking images and they have big data. They have, uh, they train the system and, and they show, in this picture there's a dog, in this picture there's a dog, in this picture's the dog, until it gets to the point where it's shown a picture in which uh, it's never seen it before, the color of the dog is different, the lighting is different, you know, but it goes and it actually creates these captions. These are computer generated captions. Uh, and it's looking at, it, at this one and it says, okay, this is a young girl in a pink shirt swinging on, on swing, as though it understands what it's looking at. This is sort of uh, what we're getting now with deep learning. Um, Tesla um, uh, auto motors, whatever, Tesla, Tesla motors, uh, they are pro uh, now producing in their electric vehicles, the latest version, all the sensors necessary to be able to do self-driving, complete self-driving cars. Um, they're still doing the, the releases and the updates. Uh, they don't have really full self-driving cars yet, uh, but they have all the hardware necessary, and it's able to sense all the way around. Um, and let me see if I can do this. Oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to pass on this. I'm not quite sure. I don't want to get stuck on anything. But anyhow, there's a YouTube video, and it shows basically what the computer's seeing as, as it's driving through a city. It's, it's identifying people and cars and buses and things like this uh, as it goes through. Um, so uh, let me just pause here and just sort of say where we're heading with, with this discussion. This is a very technical discussion, but uh, basically it's getting at, um, you know, what jobs will this latest re revolution of artificial intelligence and robotics, where is this headed in the near future? And how will that affect society in terms of, of the work uh, that society is, is left with? And how will that impact like the character of, of people as they are living in a society in which there's not so much need for them? And how does that, uh, how do Christians respond to that? So there is something called, a concept called t uh, technological unemployment uh, and frankly, this has been going on, you know, for a long time. Here's actually a photograph uh, in the early days of people out there with their scythes. What do you call it? Scythes? Yeah. Um, you know, large number of people. Well, long time ago, that was, uh, that was replaced with, like, combine, you know. Uh, and so one guy driving as opposed to all these people out there sweating. You know, maybe it's a blessing that, you know, people are not having to sweat out in the field now. But there's a lot of unemployment, right? However, we've always been able to, to respond to technology in that there's other jobs that open up and we sort of go into other diverse fields. Currently, despite all of the uh, technologic uh, developments that have put people out of work, right now unemployment rate is about 4.7%. That's pretty low. Uh, and so we've, we've found other jobs uh, to do. And so some of the Luddite concerns uh, in the past uh, really have not come true. Um, but, uh, like, here's a an, sort of a, uh, a discussion. Uh, Bill, he says, uh, we've been hearing about this technological unemployment stuff for a long time. Every time someone has said it's different this time, they've been wrong, right? Factories are going to put people out of work. Well, people went into the service industries, you know? Uh, Ted, he says, it's different this time. Bill sighed. No, really, it's actually different this time. Uh, like, for example, here's Ford Motor Company, and then here's Tesla. 
and you can see the vast numbers of people necessary to produce cars in the past are really not needed anymore, okay? Um, so let's just talk about some of the jobs that are replaceable. Well, think about how many truck drivers there are out there. I think it's like three million people. Oh, okay, six million. Um, frankly, I think 10 years. I don't, I don't, I don't see them. I, I think we're gonna have six million people out of a job in, in 10 years, just in, that, just in that sector, okay? So let me, let, me, let me, the point here is that, okay, so large numbers of people being unemployed, usually there's been other jobs for them to go into, but the question is, what other jobs will there be that these technologies will not be able to do? That's the issue. And, and what people are saying is, there's not, you know, these other jobs will be able to be done by, by these systems. Um, there are now, I mean, even, even in China, where labor is pretty cheap, there are now factories in which they have replaced people to the extent that they've actually turned the lights off and turned the air conditioners off. That's the extent to which they have eliminated people. And this is Foxconn. This is the largest uh, company in the world, employs the most people. Um, and so they're finding that these robotics are, are cheaper than even uh, cheap uh, Chinese labor. Um, how about, you know, people who interact with us who take our orders? I, I think that's going. I, I think that's going real quick. Um, and, and it's not going to just be like ATM type machines. It's, it's going to probably be, you know, Hi, I'm Cindy, and I work here at McDonald's. Uh, what would you like? And, and you're interacting with this thing, and, and it's taking your order and doing a, doing a halfway decent job. Um, uh, you know, it, and it's not just the, the, the low labor jobs. There's like, I think it was Goldman Sachs, something like that. They had a whole bunch of, you know, people employed to be traders, and I think they've like, uh, they do computer training, like 90% of, of those traders are now gone. And that's, you know, that's like not a blue collar worker job, that's, that's white collar. Um, well, what about me? <laughs> I'm a doctor, I, I work in urgent care, right? I mean, it's a complex job. I had to go to school for, for years, many years, right? To get the skills uh, to be able to work. So I, I can't be replaced, right? Um, well, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, medicine is those, those fields that are doing, dealing with image uh, recognition. I, any pathologist here? <laughs> well, there's, there's certain aspects. <laughs> uh, any radiologist here? <laughs> so, so anyhow, there's, there's certain, certain fields that are, are, just, are they're gonna go quick. Uh, not interventional radiology, but, but the reading of x-rays, for example, I, I think that that's a matter of time. What it is, is with this deep learning, you, you show it, all of these things have, have shown uh, to have rib fracture, okay? And the, syst the, the deep learning systems actually look at the images and they don't know what they're looking at first, but if you train it with enough data, eventually it says, oh yeah, that step off, that must mean a, a fracture, okay? So like, uh, this, there's a rib fracture here somewhere, but I think, Anyhow, it can't, uh, anyhow. It would be able to read it. I, I'm pretty confident that it could do a uh, probably better job than radiologists uh, for reading uh, x-rays. Um, it would be extremely diligent in looking over everything. And would have so much experience in looking over thousands to millions of, of chest x-rays that I think it would learn very well. Um, so here's a scenario where a uh, person, whether at home or in the clinic, comes in and the, can the computers take a history? In other words, medicine is an information, to a large degree, it's an information processing field. And computers can do this. We have big data. We have all sorts of histories that have done that. It's, and there's electronic medical records that have this data. You can train these systems to be able to figure out exactly what questions uh, are most correlated with the final diagnosis. Um, and so I believe that uh, histories could, at least a preliminary history could be taken. Sometimes there's nuances in the way patients uh, ask a question, but I think the initial history probably could be taken by computer. Um, and then you, um, uh, Dr. Lenny Warner did a, I think he did a study, not, not a formal study, but uh, I think residents and found out how 
well did they do, did they do in identifying um, heart murmurs? Not, not really good, and, and unfortunately. Well, you, we now have electronic stethoscopes. So some of the physicals could be, could be done uh, by computers. Um, and then labs could be, could be rather automated. Making a diagnosis, actually, I think that's um, already demonstrated to be better than, uh, than uh, primary care physicians, maybe not as good as specialists, would, but would probably get there if we're not there already. And then obviously, um, uh, prescribing, uh, electronically sending it off uh, to the pharmacy, for example, uh, as well as management. Uh, management, you, you could have the computer interacting with people at home as they check their own blood pressure. That could determine when their next visit is and, and whether earlier or later. Um, so the information technologies could really be applied fairly broadly, so maybe you could have fewer physicians needed for, uh, for, for the same number of patients. Um, well, if people are um, out of work, then how can they be supported? There's this idea of basic guaranteed income. There's been experiments in Canada and Scandinavia about uh, this sort of thing um, to where if you're a citizen, if you don't have work, well, here's sort of a permanent unemployment check. Uh, what will people do with all of their spare time if, if they're getting payments, uh, and, they, and they don't have the work, what, what do they do? Well, well, hopefully they're taking more vacations, they take up um, music, learn, learn a new instrument, or learn painting, hopefully they would do that. But what do people, what do a lot of people do when they have just free time and they don't have anything to do? Okay, uh, yeah, I'm thinking sort of... Psych hospital. <laughs> Psych hospital. <laughs> you know, par parties and video games, you know, and you got eating high-fat foods while you're watching movie after movie after movie, and, you know, your life is pointless, you know. And I, I, I'm concerned about this. I think there's a danger here that we might find people who are not working, who don't necessarily find, they feel like that their life is less valuable because they're not so useful, you know. So, so let's, let's talk about it from a Christian and biblical perspective. Work. Is work good? Well, it is good. We know this because uh, in the very beginning, Genesis 2.15, and the Lord, this is before sin entered the world. Important point. Uh, and the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. So God believes in work even apart from sin. Work, work is good. Well, after, um, after sin entered, uh, the level of work, the work requirement was increased. Uh, Genesis 3, starting with 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of, the, of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Uh. Uh, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth uh, to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and into dust shalt thou return. Um, so, so this is, uh, so this is um, after sin, and I, I didn't include it here, but uh, Ellen White says that God meant this really as a blessing. Uh, to, to keep, as after sin entered, uh, to keep people busy and occupied, and, and, uh, and I think that that's a very good thing. Here is uh, Signs of the Time. Many look upon work as a curse originating with the enemy of souls. This is a mistaken idea. God gave labor to man as a blessing to occupy his mind, to strengthen his body, and to develop his faculties. Adam labored in the Garden of Eden, and he found in mental and physical activity the highest pleasures of his holy existence. When he was driven from that beautiful home as a result of his disobedience, he was forced to struggle with his stubborn soil to gain his daily bread. That very labor was a relief to his sorrowing soul, a safeguard against temptation. Judicious labor is indispensable both to the happiness and the prosperity of our race. It makes the feeble strong, the timid brave, the poor rich, and the wretched happy. Our varied trusts are proportioned to our various abilities. 
and God expects corresponding returns for the talents he has given to his servants. It is not the greatness of the talents possessed that determines the reward, but the manner in which they are used, the degree of faithfulness with which the duties of life are performed, be they great or small. So um, <clears throat> I have applied this principle. I, I, uh, in my urgent care, we also do occupational medicine, and I sort of applied this principle of thinking we can be tempted to say, oh, if I earn more than other people, then I must be more valuable than other people. I think there is that, tem that temptation. But the fact of the matter is, when my car breaks down, am I taking it to a physician? No, I'm going to take it to a guy who has a lot of grease on his clothes, okay? He's the one, <laughs> he's the one who I need. So we, we should be very grateful for everybody who does a legitimate ser job, you know, service to other people. Every, every one of, of those people deserves our respects. Idleness is uh, one of the greatest curses that can fall upon man, for vice and crime follow in its train. Satan lies in ambush, ready to surprise and destroy those who have unguarded, whose leisure gives him opportunity to insinuate himself into their favor under some attractive guise. He is never more successful uh, than when men than when he comes to men in their idle hours. Well, I think this is the danger with technological unemployment. The consequences, I think, are um, potentially significant as society sort of with their idle hours, what might come of that. Okay. Uh, Proverbs 16.27. This is not just, uh, you know, a saying that somebody developed in the 1800s. This is in the Bible. Idle hands are the devil's uh, workshop. Uh, behold, uh, Ezekiel, behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. Um, as it was in the day of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Uh, so it will be in the end of time. So how might Christians respond to the setting of potential uh, technological unemployment and, and the consequences that it would have. Well, as we go to discussion, I want to ask, should we, if, if work is good for society, should we place ourselves on the side of legislation in which work is required, perhaps for that uh, basic uh, income? Um, is this, is this something that's appropriate uh, for us uh, to, to work towards? Um, as I've thought about it and as I've discussed it at my work, I've sort of come up with this idea. I, I find value and meaning in being a physician. I, I rather enjoy being a physician. I enjoy being helpful, you know? Um, and so if I could get a guaranteed basic income and I, stay at home, don't have to go in the clinic. No, I think I would still go in the clinic, okay? But I might not do this exact job that I'm doing now, in which is sort of, you know, I've got sometimes five minutes between patients. You know, to me, that's not the sort of job that I would, would like to have. Um, there's a lot of routine. In every line of work, there's just a lot of routine. I, I, I would find it more interesting to have sort of more varied cases, perhaps more challenging cases. Um, but I don't want to jump in the deep end and get beyond my, my abilities. So here's, here's my ideal job. Uh, I would go in about 9 o'clock in the morning, not rushed. I'd work about three hours in the morning, take about an hour and a half lunch. I'd work another three hours in the afternoon. I would see patients probably about one patient every 20 to 30 minutes, and they would be interesting cases. The computer has selected them. Uh, because they think that I would be interested in them. I mean, this is like my absolute ideal job. I've got plenty of time. Um, I, the computer sort of knows what sort of patient I'm going to be seeing, and so it does a little primer for this type of case for me. So, man, when I, when I see the patient, I'm, I'm really good. Uh, the system's set up where I can ask questions, but then it can, it's listening. It says, oh, you probably ought to ask this question, too. So, yeah, thank you. I, I asked this question. So, the patient gets as good a care as the computer system. Um, and patients probably, if they had a choice of seeing this computer systems or seeing a real person, they would prefer a real person. So it would be competition for my time. 
you know? And other people who might think, you know, being a doctor would be nice. Perhaps they could get the training and, and be able to, uh, to more, more people could be doctors because after all, doctors are not working as hard uh, as, as they are because the system's set up. So in my mind, maybe that might be um, the way that I'd like to see this. Could, could we in society, could we say, yeah, computers and, and these systems can do it better, uh, but we still want work. And so could we, the voters, legislate that, you know, some work is, set, is re retained for, for us people. Okay. So uh, why did I put this picture here? Oh, uh, yeah. So what I think we ought to, ought to also do is I don't think we ought to just take what's coming sitting down. As Christians, we understand the value of work in a way that, that somebody who doesn't have faith, I, I think, doesn't. They might be able to, uh, ethics, but, but I think we have an understanding of, of how people are blessed uh, by work. And so instead of uh, just going along with the flow and just seeing what happens when these technologies emerge and, and are applied in society, um, I think that we need to speak with our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, uh, and advocating that, helping people understand that there's real value in work and that we should seek to be productive and seek to be a blessing and play that role of blessing other people uh, through work. So that's, as Dr. Geem says, that's my take. Now it's time for you. Yeah. I don't really, I'm not really afraid of technology taking over everything. What I'm afraid of is the government the government restricting your um, your ability to create. It just seems like no matter what you come up with, whatever you think of to to create something to take over, there's always something else you could do. But there's a possibility that some government regulation will keep you from doing that. So, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, so, so what would they prevent us from doing? I'm just thinking that, okay, you can come up with a system that will take care of everything we know of right now. As soon as they do that, well then, people are creative enough to see that there's other aspects in life they can go into that they don't even know about yet. That's my... That's why I'm not really scared of technology. But what I'm really scared of is that people that have the current technology will go make some sort of government regulation to hold to that technology and we'll have to live with that. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, go ahead. I think we may need to consider redefining the definition of work. There, um, back in the the change of the century from the 1800s to the 1900s, Charles Eliot at Harvard University decided that he needed to have a committee of 10 to sit down with and decide what education would be. We're still doing education in this country the same way Charles Eliot said we did. Until we seriously look at restructuring education from kindergarten through graduate school, through medical school, we're going to continue to say, oh my goodness, what are we going to do when technology comes? Because we can't imagine that life is ever going to be any different than it is right now. And so the outliers are able to come up with interesting new stuff without going through our system. And we come up with people like Bill Gates and, and Steve Jobs, who are able to see that there are other ways to do what we've typically done. And so I don't worry that technology is going to come along and replace us. 
I think that when, when we're free from the constraints that have been built into our educational system, that then individuals will begin to come up with interesting things. There are today literally dozens of new kinds of sports, and you can say, well, sports aren't work. We'll say that to somebody that has to work really hard to get to the Olympics. There are different kinds of works. There are dozens of things that you can do with the human body in sports that are very much work, and people will pay lots of money to go and see or to learn how to do. So I, th I think that we need to just expand what we think work is. And then one other point that I would like to say, I think we're way beyond whether or not the physician can stay at home and do his thing. We're doing that already. I have a pacemaker. I don't have to go into the doctor to have him check my pacemaker. I plug it into a telephone. It goes to some place here at Loma Linda. He looks at paper, a piece of paper and says, yeah, you're fine. I never see him. I mean, I actually do see him a couple times a year, but it's not necessary. Right. In fact, recently they fired the nurse that would tell me to put the, the magnet over my pacemaker so she could see whether it was working. Now I just put the magnet on, hook the telephone up, and lo and behold, everything is done. So we're leaping way ahead of what we think we ought to be doing because of the educational constraints we put on people's brains by a 19th century educational system developed by Charles Eliot at Harvard. Let's move away from thinking about education like we do. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Well, I, I'm seeing two out of two people are not concerned. So this, I wonder <laughs> if this is a trend. This is maybe encouraging. <laughs> I think we're going to do that. <laughs> I, I was curious um, about your opinion uh, in regards to AI being able to make moral decisions or judgments. Wow. <sighs> we could we could like program moral decisions. In in fact, there is. There's a uh, discussion about, um, yeah, hold on, just, I don't know if you want to have a follow-up question, but, okay, yeah. Um, I, I think that probably, um, probably morality could be learned to at least be simulated. Uh, for example, we might be able to do right now do an expert system programming and you put in situations that a patient is in and, and going through the ethical process. You, know, you might be able to program that. Is that, is that real? So these AI conscience? systems that could quote unquote do morality would be dependent on the opinions of maybe a very small group. Or if you had big data of people people's cell phone conversations, whatever, maybe it can learn from the population. Uh, but is that true conscience? I think, I, I believe that God speaks through, speaks to our conscience, and I don't think we're going to program God into the system. So. Uh, no, I think there was another, okay, go for it, David. Yeah, along, kind of along the lines of that, I was reading, you know, about the artificial intelligence for these cars, these driverless cars. Somebody has to program Okay, if you're on a road and you see somebody in front of you, do you hit that person or do you crash into a mountain or do you go over the edge? You know, do you try to right. save the person right. up there or do you try to, you know, they're trying to figure out the ethics of programming what this car is going to do in that kind of a situation. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting and, discussion. And that's current. Let, let, me, let me just mention, um, I, I, I forgot to mention this, but um, Tesla is using those sensors to record uh, all the images and the radar signatures and whatnot, and then it's watching the drivers, and it's learning that, oh, when I come to a road and there's these white things going by like this, the person tends to turn left. So it's learning how to drive by watching its drivers drive, okay? Plus, they're able to, to um, sort of add the, the learning between the different cars so that the one system has the experience of millions of hours of driving. 
in, in all sorts of visual, in dark, you know, dark lighting and things like this. It's actually learning, and then they take that mass of learning and then putting it back uh, to, to the cars. Uh, and so that's how they're, these cars are learning how to drive. And, and, and nobody's sitting there saying, oh, when you get in the situation, do this, you know. But in the situation where you have an ethical decision like that, do, do you sacrifice the one driver who paid for the car and paid for the system, or do you take out two people, two cyclists, for example, you know. <laughs> it's an interesting, I don't know how that's going to play out. Insurance? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You're talking morality and ethical stuff. Can you legislate that? Is the computer going to say this is moral and this is not moral? And you as a physician, you're sitting there and you have patients who are depressed because they're all out of job. Maybe some are very happy, but most are not. They're depressed, they're sitting in the corner sucking their thumb. So, um, and then you physician, you're being replaced as well. You know, the radiologist lies down and looks at the MRI on the screen, and the ceiling, and he has, he has no job now because the computer is doing the work. So all these guys are out of work. I mean, we, I'm not sure we can even imagine that time coming. Yeah. Before long, the president is replaced by a computer. My, now the lawyer is not needed anymore. <laughs> Executron 2000. I might vote for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I don't think we can really, truly picture a time like this coming, but it is coming. Yeah, the the problem with accelerating technologies is is it's hard to predict, but I think in the near term we can predict self-driving trucks, eight big rigs. I think we can predict that, but what comes after that? You know, I don't know. Here. So I'm sitting here listening to all this and I'm thinking this is just like heaven, you know. Uh, but are we going to have an economy? Who's going to pay us? And what are, how, what are we going to buy all this stuff with? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, that's, that's a common question. <laughs> if, if you don't have any people working, then who's paying the taxes to give the basic income, you know? Um, and I don't know, that's just a big discussion. I haven't, I don't know that I've heard the definitive answer to that. I mean, I think part of it is if you reduce the cost of 3D printing your house and, you know, 3D printing this and that, um, the cost comes down to the, the level of the materials and the amortization of, of the hardware, you know, to produce it, the tools. So we're going to have to sell our vegetables from the garden in order to buy these cheap benefits. I mean, I have no idea. It just doesn't make sense I know. for an ordinary person. From an economic standpoint, I'm not quite sure how this all plays out. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to come back to the idea of idleness, the devil's workshop. Uh, we've seen this in society, and I'm concerned about. Uh, getting too automated here that uh, life gets too easy. I think this can have its uh, serious consequences. Uh, tribalism sets in very easily uh, in, in society, and uh, we have the evidence of gangs shooting each other up uh, in our cities where um, employment is low. Uh, I, I think you're concerned about uh, Strengthening the value of work is as important. So, so my opinion, without having really discussed it with other people, is I think that legislation uh, in these areas I think is appropriate if the impact has a significant negative impact on society. You know, things that are that are considered uh, moral or religious, whatnot. If they have a significant impact. Uh, on society, then I think that is appropriate for civil legislation. So I myself would would favor um, legislation. If it really looks like that idleness is, it causes an increase in crime, for example, then, then I would be supportive that maybe we need some legislation to say, you know, even though you don't, we don't need you to work, we need you to work. 
that makes sense. Uh, can we get the microphone back up? This is an, um, perhaps a strange comment in this context. Uh, in the late 1800s, I think maybe 1894 or something like that, Mrs. White wrote that, I think in Signs of the Times or something, um, that we should not be saying, the Lord is going to come within five years because then we won't be occupying till he comes. We won't be building sound buildings. We won't finish our PhD. We'll think we should just be out there doing something quick to get the world ready for the second coming. She said, on the other hand, if we say, oh, well, he's not coming for 10 years, that that's an attitude of, well, I can do as I please, and when it gets closer to the second coming, about eight years from now, then I'll settle down, repent. Um, I don't think she's setting time. I think she's talking about the attitude that we need to have. And in the context of this work revolution, um, we should be at about seven and a half years. <laughs> sort of a balance between um, taking it into account and planning for it, but not thinking, oh, 20, 30 years, you know, um, as the focal point, as the center point, that we are here to help the world. We are here to hasten his coming, and we need to find that attitude point where we're neither hastening uh, our own demise by neglecting preparation of ourselves and others, or just thinking, oh, well, someday. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I appreciate that. I respect that, and I, I agree with you on that. Um, you know, in, for everybody who's interested in sort of looking at the future and what the future might bring, uh, as ad Adventists in particular, I think that we need to uh, always balance that with, say, you know, the Lord could come very soon. It looks like he, he will. Um, and so I think these are sort of tentative sorts of things. At some point, Jesus is going to return, and that's the end of it. At whatever point that we have this technological development or whatnot, that's, that's where it stops, you know. Um, and uh, so to what extent are we actually going to experience this before the Lord returns? We can't say for sure, uh, but we might be part way into it, you know. Any other comments? If we could get the microphone. Do you have a comment? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I tremble before these imponderable questions that you've been raising this morning. But I'm grateful that you've done it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, what you have not mentioned is the risk of boredom in a society where we don't have all the work that seems to have been programmed into Adam and Eve. If if there isn't a lot of work to do, what are people, they get up to mischief in their spare time. <laughs> right. And if that becomes an impossible problem for the human race, please, what are we ever going to do throughout eternity? And boredom in heaven threatens to become a serious issue. And we've always answered that question by saying, We've got eternity to discover and learn and comprehend with our limited resources all the thoughts and impenetrableness <laughs> of God himself. So you see, we're bordering on territory which seems to me to be beyond our comprehension and and I hesitate. It's holy ground for me, but it's a part of artificial intelligence and I don't think that AI is ever going to get into the area of morality where we're even still wrestling with the problem of dictation transcription. Uh, 
in order that we can dictate our clinical notes and so on. Uh, that's just a technical exercise. But the meaning of the words, the meaning, and that, then that goes to morality, then that goes to uh, the intricacies of philosophic exchange. And we're back with the Greeks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for raising questions. But those questions keep me very, very humble. Thank you for your comments. Yes, um, I just wanted to say I, I agree as well that technology is probably going to have a, a great impact on, on work availability in, in some sectors. And there's another level of danger, too, that I see in that it, if AI comes to be something that people are relying on for information, what type of information is going to be coming out of that system? In other words, is it going to be unbiased? If you were to ask uh, AI about origins, for instance, how is it going to determine the answer? Is it going to be because the programmers have already decided that it's going to, to lean a certain way? Will it be able to truly look at information unbiasedly? Great question. Um, to some extent, you know, programmers are losing their jobs too in that the programming is being done by exposing these deep learning networks to, to data. And so the question is, is what is it learning from the data? Here, here's an interesting example. And I just read the headline. I didn't read, read the article, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm speculating as to what it, it is. But apparently some of these networks, as they have been exposed to data and they learn, they actually pick up some, um, some racism. Uh, and so it, it'll develop opinions about people of different races based upon the data that it received, okay? So that, that's sort of a problem. Um, now, it, is it really racist? Does it hate people of some origin? You know, I, I don't think so, you know, but it's acting that way. So yeah, there, there's these issues. Was there, yeah, there's a, let's get a microphone over there. There are two factors that drive the development of technology. One is people who want to have better tools to do better work. And if you have better tools, you can do a better job, you can have a better reputation, you might be able to charge more, have a better life. On the other hand, uh, investors are willing to put up their money so that robotics can be created to put all these people out of work and then they derive the profit from it. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about whether legislation is needed, that might be something that would be discussed or taken into consideration. Should there be caps on profitability of these kinds of things uh, for putting people out of work? Uh, we have usury laws. And so th those are caps on how much profit can be made off of lending money. Um, should we also apply that to this? Or maybe require that additional jobs be created uh, when you put people out of work. Uh, I, I know that when my kids were little and they didn't have uh, toys, they would invent their own games. Adults are creative too. And people who want to work will invent work. Thank you. That, that's, uh, I think, good. Insightful. The forum asks what my occupation is. What occupies me? I am a poet. I am a writer, an author. I'm a philosopher. I'm one who appreciates the greater things of the mind. So this is an occupation. Creating a poem is an occupation. And I think you should pay to read my book of poems. All right. Speaking of which, um, I, I could have showed you uh, computer-generated music, like actually Bach, uh, and uh, art as well. Um, so we think that maybe computers can't be creative, but computers can be creative too. I'm not saying that puts you out of your 
<laughs> out of your occupation. But uh, computers can, can go there as well. Uh, what's quite interesting uh, is with these, these neural networks, they can actually expose the, the network to all of box music and then and, and train the, the strengths of the connections through the different nodes. And what, what it's able to do is able to say, oh, when you have this pattern of nodes, when, when Bach has this pattern of nodes, probably the next note that's going to be played is such and such. Uh, and, uh, and so what happens is the computer is able to compose Bach-like music based upon Bach's music, but you hit the button and there's another Bach music. There's another Bach song, another Bach song. Um, it's sort of bizarre <laughs> to where we have now Bach is now like digitized. I, I don't know. Go to, go to YouTube uh, if you type in uh, computer generated music, Bach, uh, you'll find it. Let me see if we get lucky here. Are you doing that? Is there going to be part two next week? Or? Yeah. yeah, but, it, but it's uh, not so much about unemployment as it is about um, uh, the impact that technology has relative to faith. Uh, there's some positive impacts, but, but some negative impacts. And it's, I'm not even gonna, gonna mention unemployment. It's gonna be more like uh, what technology is doing in terms of our, our character and spirituality. Yeah. You know, through this all, I think I can see the ugly head of total control trying to get itself up. It's it possible. It can be, yes. I think it is very possible that uh, someone says, I am in control of everyone around the world. Is it going to happen? It's possible. I think things are coming to a climax. Or, or it could be possible that it's, um, that it's the people themselves that start heading in, in the same direction. I, I, I sort of wonder about the antediluvians and whether they had a lot of idleness and whether that led to their society sort of becoming corrupt. Aren't we seeing that right now? Right, <laughs> right, as it was in the days of Noah. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's another issue that we already have now, and that that's the issue of privacy. It, uh, even with the technology we have now, there, it, it's a big issue and something that needs to be considered. Yeah. Too late. Let's, let's go ahead and close here and then if anybody else wants to carry on the conversation, uh, feel free. Come on down. Thank you.